Uh, you know, I had a real terrible thing happen this week. I mean, it's not that terrible, but it's a little bit for me uh, as a preacher. I was working on my message, and uh, on Thursday, um, after about, you know, two or three hours of work, you know, content that I was putting together, the message, it, the computer crashed, and I couldn't recover the file. And the old file I had was like just my outline pretty much. And I was, you know, I had done a lot of work on this. So I was really uh, kind of upset about this a bit. And so we went to a prayer meeting with our pastors and they said, you know what, maybe God has a different word, you know, for our church. And I was like, I liked the word that he had already given me, you know, <laughs> this is stressful now to have to write all this again. But uh, I uh, got in touch with my friend who's really into computer stuff. And he said, send me the file. I sent the file. Five minutes later, he goes, I recovered it. <laughs> and it was Thank you. It was so great. But it was nice to get that, you know, file resurrected, right? It was like when something is dead, when something is gone, you want it to be resurrected because it feels so much better. And when things are brought back to life, right? If um, this church, our anniversary, we're celebrating this, this is life here, right? It's just an exciting thing. And when there's resurrection, when there's new life that comes to something that was dying or dead, it feels really good. It feels supernatural. It gets you excited about things, right? And I had that joy when my file was recovered. I could go about the rest of my day because I knew that I didn't have to put another three or four hours on Saturday to get back the things that I'd had. Resurrection is a powerful thing. And in the Bible, we see the power of resurrection in Jesus Christ. When we see Jesus dead, buried, and resurrected, that is what our faith is built upon. That is the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about the gospel. It is believing that Jesus, he was dead, buried, and resurrected. And all of those things are needed to understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ um, the resurrection of Jesus is as important as the death of Jesus. I want to share that again. The resurrection of Jesus is as important as the death of Jesus. You can't separate those things. They need to be together in our understanding. It is a doctrine that our church, the church of Jesus Christ, is built upon. On Easter morning, we're going to celebrate his resurrection from the grave from the dead. And because he is the first in that sense, we too then will also have hope that we can be resurrected one day. The question of what happens to us after we die is a question that people wonder about. You know, I get my career, I work for 40 years, I retire, I go to Florida, and then I die, and then I repeat, is this it? Is this all we have? There's life after death. There's life that comes after death. Um, Hindus believe in reincarnation. They believe that you come back uh, in another form. If you've done good, you come back better. If you've done worse, you come, if you've done poorly, you come back worse. That is the idea of karma. In Egypt, there's a book called the Book of the Dead, and it reflects on the Egyptians' belief of the afterlife. And as I was reading, they said they believe that there's a solar barge that transports people into the next life. And one of these was found in the tombs of one of the pharaohs. 2,500 years before Jesus Christ was born, they had a belief that there was something else, but they didn't understand what it was. And the Jewish people, they believe in resurrection, but not all of them believed in it. There's one group of people, the Sadducees, who did not believe in the resurrection, and that's who we're going to see and talk about for the first time in Luke. We're coming to interact with this group of people, the Sadducees. We're in a series that's called The Passion. We're going through a two-year study in the book of Luke, verse by verse, and we're making our way. And now we are in Luke chapter 20, uh, verses 27. And as we've made our way in the Gospel of Luke, we've seen him travel from his home down south towards Jerusalem. And he starts to pick up followers on the way. And just a couple weeks ago, we remembered him coming into Jerusalem on that donkey being called a king. And then he approached the walls of Jerusalem with tears in his eyes because they didn't know the kind of peace that he is bringing. And the people are hanging on his every word, teaching day after day in the temple. So what we're in right now until, the, until Easter is really all happening in and around Jerusalem. Everything is happening right around there. This last week of Jesus' life is what we're documenting and going through verse by verse. So Luke 20, verse 27 you can follow along in a Bible, you can pull up on your Bible app or just search on a browser. It'd be great to have your eyes on a copy of the Word of God too. The title of the message is The Resurrection Reality. 
the resurrection reality, Luke 20, verse 27 says, There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. First, let's consider this about the resurrection reality. The powerless skeptic denies it. The powerless skeptic denies it. There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. He's in the temple, as I said, and he's speaking. The Sadducees, they are one of the different sects of Judaism, and they're this uh, group of people. They're wealthier. They uh, would have had, like, the aristocrats who are following them. They trace their heritage and lineage back to David, uh, David's high priest, Zadok. And so this is who they say we're from the line of Zadok, and so they've got more wealth. They uh, walk around with these long robes, and they uh, have the people uh, trying to, uh, they're trying to help the people to understand, but their view on the resurrection is that it doesn't exist. They also don't believe in angels and demons. They base their views of uh, God not on the whole Old Testament, but only the first five books. The law of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is what the Sadducees follow, and we're going to see how that plays out. Uh, when we were in Philadelphia, we went to a church called Calvary Chapel, and at Calvary Chapel, Pastor Joe Foch, he used to always say, the Sadducees, they're sad, you see. The Sadducees, you can remember that. I always, it always stuck with me. And the reason why they're sad, you see, is because they don't believe in the resurrection. What, what, a, what a crazy life you live if you don't believe in the resurrection. You just die and that's it. This is useless, our life. It's just... Sad, you see. Okay, so you guys are going to get that. You'll remember that. This is the first time that Luke is coming in contact, that Luke is talking about the Sadducees, and they disappear after uh, Jerusalem is um, taken down in 70 AD. So this is it. They're, they only have another 40 years, and then they don't exist anymore. We've heard about the Pharisees pretty regularly. The Pharisees, they actually believe a lot of the Old Testament, right? They're trying to teach these things, but they start to add rules to it. That's the Pharisees. The scribes are also a part of the Pharisees. They're teachers of the law. They're experts. They would debate. They would teach. They would try to help people understand that the Pharisees, as they're teaching, that they are teaching what God wants. And the Sadducees, these are the ones who also are there, but they don't believe in the resurrection. But the thing that they all have in common, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they all have this in common, is that they don't want Jesus around anymore. They all want him gone. They want him to disappear. In verse 28, it says, and they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses, remember I said they follow the first five books, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, first five books accredited to have been written by Moses. So here they are saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife with no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Jesus, like other religious leaders, is going to be trapped by the Sadducees. They're trying to trap him like the Pharisees were doing. They want to question something that they've believed and try to flip him around a bit and see if he can answer this. And the question is about the resurrection, the resurrection reality. uh, The question that they're asking or what they're talking about is from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5. I'm not going to read it all, but uh, basically, if uh, brothers are dwelling together and the wife of one of the brothers dies, if the next brother is not yet married, he's supposed to take the wife and raise the child as the son and heir of the first brother. All right, so this is what he's talking about here. And this is what they're doing. So this was a law. This is what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to perpetuate the family line. That person is called the Goel. Goel, it's a redeemer, a kinsman redeemer. Like in the book of Ruth, Boaz was the kinsman redeemer, a family member of uh, a family member who ended up taking Ruth for his own. He's fulfilling the Leverite law. And this is what we're seeing here. They're asking this question. But they keep going. Verse 29, now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. Okay, so one died. And the second got her, no children. And the third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. Let's just think about this. He's like, they're like, all right, so there's seven brothers. Uh, the first one dies. The second one takes them. The second one dies too. Then the third comes and wants to take this wife. The fourth brother should be like, hold on a second. 
I don't, I don't know about this. Somebody should investigate this wife, right? And I'm sure that some of those disciples had the same joke that I was thinking, but it's not recorded. They didn't say it if they were thinking it. But this is crazy. It's like ridiculous. They take it to this extreme because they're trying to understand. They're trying to trap him about resurrection. It's a practical idea. They don't believe in the resurrection, so they want to disqualify the resurrection. We get married here, and what's going to happen? Who's going to be the wife? Your logic doesn't make sense, Jesus. There is no resurrection because of marriage. How can you have seven husbands? That is wrong, Jesus. And so you are wrong. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to trap him. All seven of the brothers died. There were no heirs. And finally, the wife dies too. Verse 33. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as a wife. The Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection. And so they are trying in practical terms to trap him, to try to help him to see that his view of the resurrection is also wrong. She had seven husbands. Whose wife will she be? Which one of them? Now, we're going to get to Jesus' answer shortly, but I want you to think about this in your own life and your own journey towards belief. Some of you here are all in. You're just, yeah, I believe it. I understand. There's some things that I'm not sure about. I get to this part of the scripture. There's a couple of verses I, I just don't understand yet, and I believe that God is going to reveal those in the days ahead, or one day you can ask him yourself, and it's going to make sense. So most of you are all in. I would say most of the people in our church are all in, but there's some who are skeptics. Some are like, I don't believe all the things that you're saying. You know, I, I hear what you're saying here, but I don't believe it, and this is what's happening with this group of people. They're skeptics. They don't believe We understand the mystery. There's so much mystery with the word of God and with what God is doing in the world. And yet by faith, we believe and we accept some of these things. In Matthew's account of this same interaction, Matthew chapter 22, verse 29, Jesus says this, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. The reason that you don't believe in the resurrection is because you are powerless Powerless skeptics, they deny it. You're powerless and you don't know the scripture. They're misinformed. They just haven't studied. If you would have studied, if you'd understood, you could have understood these things, but they're powerless and uninformed. And the Sadducees, they want to debate with Jesus to trap him, but they're going to fail like everybody else. They haven't given themselves over to this deeper understanding, to the hard work of studying the word of God and try to understand it. And if you get lazy, if you just say, you know what, I don't believe it, I'm not going to look into it, you're going to be in the same boat as them, powerless, denying things that are so true that could be consequential for your whole life. And so we want to be people of the book. Jesus keeps on bringing, back, bringing people back to the word of God. And so they are powerless because they don't understand the scripture. And we're a part of a faith that wasn't man-made. Our faith was instituted by God himself. He created it. He uh, made the way for us to be saved and to have life and to understand. And we have everything we need. The word of God says we have everything we need for life and godliness already. It's already here for us. But there are some skeptics. Now, if you're a skeptic yourself, I just encourage you to keep on reading, keep on studying, keep on asking the questions, keep on seeking, read a book. Talk to somebody, get prayer if you're skeptical about these things that we talk about. If you have a skeptic in your life, if you're somebody who is friends with people who don't know the Lord and you have skeptics, people who are just like, I don't believe what it is that you believe, it's fine for you. I would encourage you to know what you believe so you can defend the faith if ever needed. I'm not talking about, you know, being obnoxious about it. You know, you can disagree with a lot of people about a lot of things, but at a dinner or sometime, if somebody says something and it's so contrary to what you believe and they, you know, say something negative about Jesus, you could speak up and say, no, 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 listen, I want to, you can believe that if you want, but I want to just tell you true about Jesus. You know, sometimes we don't say those things. They say, don't talk about religion or politics. And you can leave politics aside and keep on going. But with this, with Jesus, if they say something, you should know what it is that you believe so you can give an answer for your faith. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says this, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Have a reason for your hope, but then as you do it, do it with gentleness and respect. Listen to people. So you have skeptics. Are you a kind of person who is gentle and respectable and able to talk accurately about these things? This is the kind of followers of Christ that 
God wants. You hear people say things all the time that you don't believe. And so I would say this, know why you believe and know what you believe so you can share with people who don't believe. Know why you believe, know what you believe so you can share with people who don't believe. The resurrection reality, uninformed, powerless skeptic denies it. Now, Jesus is going to answer the question, verse 34, continuing on. And Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy, worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. The resurrection reality, faith makes me worthy to attain it. Faith makes me worthy to attain it. And Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. Talking about the resurrection here, he's answering the question, and he first talks about this age, the sons of this age. This age is what we're in right now. All of us, we are living, we are part of this age. And the sons of this age, we marry and are given in marriage. So we do this. It's part of what happens. In Genesis, they said to, the Bible says to uh, procreate, right? To uh, multiply, be fruitful and multiply. And so this is part of what we're supposed to do. So we marry while we are in this age. It is a part of God's plan. Marriage relationship is the way that we are supposed to be fulfilled in our relationship with another person of the opposite sex. It's in marriage. And so this is what is supposed to happen here. And so we marry in this way. It's a sacred thing. It's a holy thing. And it is for this age. Marriage is not eternal. Marriage isn't for the next, gen next life because in that life, we are married, in a sense, to Christ himself. Right? He is the bridegroom and we, the church, are the bride. Verse 35 but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age, we talked about this age, now let's talk to that age, and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. The next age, the age to come, heaven, afterlife, when we die, where we'll be forever. Not everyone will be worthy to enter it. Not everybody's going to be worthy to attain it. Only way that you can attain, be worthy to attain it, is by faith. And in the Old Testament, faith in God, and now we know faith in Jesus Christ and the finished work, but this is the only way that you can be with God forever. Attain also to the resurrection from the dead, right? We're talking about resurrection. It's just all over the text, the resurrection reality. There is no marriage in eternity. They don't marry in eternity. Marriage was for earth. For this age, in that age, there is no marriage because we will walk with God. We're not going to have a need for somebody like our spouse here. So that is right. Your husband or your wife will not be your husband or wife in heaven. So be careful. Don't, don't, no smiling or sadness, whatever. Just <laughs> nobody's looking around. Be careful or as you... I didn't write it. I'm just sharing with you. The primary reason is in heaven we are married to Christ. So these relationships are for your birth. You'll know this person, I believe, but you're not going to have the same relationship that you had here. It will be different in heaven. That age is different. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. In heaven, there's no more death. We are not angels, but we are equal to angels. You know, some people will say at a funeral, sometimes you hear, oh, oh, this person died and now they're an angel. God went another angel. That's not true. But they are equal to angels in the sense that if you, when you're resurrected, eventually you will not, um, you're not uh, an angelic being, but you don't need to marry. You don't have the same needs that you had when you were here. And so this is what happens in the resurrection. It'll all be fulfilled in that age. This age that we're in right now is the opportunity to actually confess Christ. This age is the opportunity to get right with God, to be worthy to attain it. And if you think that you're worthy to attain it just because you've done good, then you are missing the point. Jesus is saying it is faith in God that makes you worthy to attain it. If you want to be with God forever, 
Don't just try to be kind. I see these t-shirts now, and I think they're great. Be kind. We all need a little more kindness in the world. But if you think just me being kind is what it takes to make me worthy to attain eternity to get to that age, you will be in for a rude awakening. It's not the way it is. It is through faith, and now we know faith in Jesus Christ. We confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised from the dead, and you will be saved, the Bible says. This is what we're talking about. Jesus says you can be worthy to attain it, but not just by doing good. There is a faith that is required. The resurrection reality, faith makes me worthy to attain it. We're going to be talking about this a little bit more. You may even have an opportunity You can do that right now. You can just say, I believe Jesus. I confess Jesus as Lord. If you've never done that, I want you to be ready to attain eternal life. And it is by believing that somebody else took your place. I say it here all the time. The cross is over here. I was going this way and I turned to Jesus and he forgives me. This is what we get. It's this great exchange that happens. The resurrection reality, faith makes me worthy to attain it. Verse 37, but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed. In the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. We're looking at the reality of the resurrection. And Jesus now uses something just practical in language, practical things in language of why the resurrection is real. The God of the living defends it. The God of the living defends it. Notice it here. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Let me break that down a little bit. Jesus, now to defend himself, be ready in season, out of season, know how you can defend your faith. Jesus, he actually goes to their books. He says, okay, you want to talk about this? Let's go to Moses. You only believe in Moses. You don't believe in our sponsors. Let's just go to Moses, first five books. Let's go to this story that you know so well in Exodus chapter 3 of Moses before the bush. Let's talk about this for a little bit. The God of the living defends it. See, the Sadducees, they followed Moses too, so let's talk about that. Exodus 3, it tells the story, and this is what happened. Uh, Moses, he was actually born, he's Jewish, he was Hebrew. He was born uh, to, um, you know, a Hebrew woman, and uh, she ended up... um, putting him in the water, in these, the rushes of weed and uh, the reeds there. And um, someone in Pharaoh's family ended up finding Moses and then raised him as her own. And so he was raised there in uh, splendor and glory with wealth. And uh, at one point then, he finds that somebody is mistreating one of his people, a Jewish person. So he kills the Hebrew who is mistreating the Jewish person. Then somebody later says, I saw what you did. We know what you did. And then in fear, he flees his home in Egypt, and he gets to Midian, to this place. He was in a city. You can think of it. He was in Chicago, and now he's living in, I don't know, country far west. DeKalb? (laughs) Did somebody say DeKalb? I think it's even further than DeKalb. He is like in the middle of nowhere, sheep, and he's a shepherd, and he ends up uh, being a part of this family there in Midian. And um, Moses, he uh, ends up there, he's with his sheep, and his attention is drawn to the mount, I think it's Mount Horeb, he's drawn to this mountain because there's a bush that is on fire, but it's not burning up. So he goes over, and then out of the bush, he hears this voice, take off your sandals because the place that you're standing is holy ground. You know, take it off. Wow, this bush is speaking, and it's not on fire. And so he goes before this bush, and the bush starts to speak. And it is God speaking from the bush. And God identifies himself as the God of of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Present tense. 500 years they've been dead before Moses meets him at the bush, and God refers to them as in the present. He's using logic, just language. You know, my dad had a lot of friends. There's some crazy stories of how this happens in immigrant communities. It happens all the time. If you were born here and you've had generations that immigrated a long time ago, this doesn't happen as much. Once we assimilate and we start to look like um, most of the population, it doesn't happen. But what happens is, especially in the 1960s and 70s, people come to the country and they don't know anybody, right? They've just gotten off a 
a boat if it's in the 50s and 60s many times, uh, off a plane. And so this happened so many times. I've heard three stories, the same thing. A person got to Washington, D.C. They opened up the book, the phone book. There was a phone book there was back in the day. Not on your phone anymore. It was an actual book that had all these, the white pages. They went to a pay phone. You have to put a quarter in a phone. They went to a pay phone, and they opened up this book, and they just looked for names that looked like Indian names from the same place they're from. And so they came to George Zachariah. And you're like, that sounds like an American name. No, but if you're from the place we're from in India, George Zachariah, this person is probably from our place. There's so many George Zacharias in Kerala where we're from. And so they just call up, hi, I'm Thomas Matthew. I'm, you know, whatever, just I'm this person. And uh, I looked up in a phone book and I saw your George Zachariah. You're from India. Yes, I am. I'm here at this uh, payphone over here. Can you come pick me up? I'm on my way. I mean, it is crazy. <laughs> this is what happens. It happens all the time. Three testimonies about this when my dad was dying. This is what happened. I came to D.C. and I called. He picked me up, took me to church. Never knew him before. It's like that's the way it is. Kind of inside secret of immigrant communities. We do this. And when my dad died, I got emails from people and phone calls from people saying, I was friends with your dad. I studied with your dad. I went to uh, college with your dad. I was in your dad's first youth group. I was, uh, the, I was a student in his a dorm where he was the person who was like the resident director. It was all past tense. Not one of those people said, I am friends with your dad. Because it doesn't make sense. If they said, I am friends with your dad, it's like, no, I was. It's just, you don't even know you're doing it. But you take a change that happens. You're not calculating it. You just change it because of the language. You're just like, oh, it's no longer I was this way. And Jesus, he says, I am. I am the God of currently. He uses language. The God of the living defends it. See, Jesus is trying to make a point about the resurrection. Right now, the ones who you followed, the ones who you revere, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are right now calling me God. Right now. So the God of the living defends it. Verse 38, now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. God is a God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are living, and they defend it. The resurrection reality, the God of the living, defends it. Only living people have a God. It says, for all live to him. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they, you're like, well, they didn't have faith in Christ. Yes, but they believed they had faith in God, and that faith back then is credited to them as righteousness. In the same way that now, what I talked about before, our faith in Jesus Christ for him dying, the one who's speaking this, the Messiah, I'm going to talk about that in a moment, the same way that he has made us righteous and able to attain the resurrection, they also had that for all live. They're alive right now with God. Verse 39, then some of the scribes answered. Remember the scribes are the teachers of the law. They believe in resurrection. Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dare to ask him any questions. The scribes, they believe it. They're like, we don't agree with the Sadducees, because they're sad, you see. They are out. They don't understand it. But you have spoken well in this. The scribes, they compliment Jesus, and they no longer dare ask him a question. They're afraid because of the intellect. They're afraid because Jesus knows what is true. Jesus is not going to let them go just yet, though. He has a question for the scribes, probably for all of the opponents there at the time, scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees. He says, Verse 41, but he said to them, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? The resurrection reality, the life of Jesus displays it. The very life of Jesus is on display showing that the resurrection is true, and he's using another logical point, another thing about language to try to help them understand. And it's interesting now he goes to David. He's going to the Psalms, the Sadducees. I defended the resurrection, of, the resurrection with Moses. Now I'm over here with you, scribes. You believe in David. Let me talk to you a little bit about David. But he said to them, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? Let me just pause here for a moment. Jesus Christ. Let's just talk about that name for a moment. 
Jesus Christ. For those of you who are newer to the faith, you know, a lot of times we think, you know, Jesus Christ, that's his full name. And that might be news to you. And that's okay. You know, we all have to learn at some point. But Jesus Christ isn't his name. It's not like, you know, uh, I was going to say, you know, Tommy, <laughs> so funny. I was going to say Tommy Christian. His last name is Christian. I was like, it's not like his name was, oh my gosh, and I picked Tommy Christian. Okay. Um, Jesus Christ, that's not his full name, right? Jesus, it's, it's uh, uh, really what his name was. Well, let me break it down for you. Jesus is actually the Greek translation of Yeshua or Joshua. So Jesus, when he was a little boy going around, they'd be Yeshua, right? Joshua, that was his name. And then in Greek, it's translated to Jesus, right? So this is how it is. And in Spanish, it's Jesus, right? So uh, Jesus is the Greek translation of Joshua. Christ is a title. It means anointed one, Messiah, the one who was to come. His name probably would have been um, Yeshua bar Joseph or Joshua bar Joseph. Joshua bar means son of. Joseph is the father. So Barabbas, we're going to come to him later when we're at the uh, trial of Jesus. Barabbas means son of the father, bar Abba. Barabbas, son of the father, bar, bar Joseph. That, so his name was probably Joseph bar, sorry, Joshua bar Joseph, something like that. But how do we get Jesus Christ? It means that he is the anointed one, the deliverer, the one they were waiting for, the Messiah, the one who was going to be the sacrifice, and they didn't see it clearly. Joshua, Yeshua, means God is my deliverer, deliverer, and Christ means anointed one. God is my deliverer, the anointed one. Even his name is preaching a message about who he is. The life of Jesus displays it. People would say this, David's son is going to be the Messiah. David's heir, somebody from David's family, because they were studying the Old Testament. They knew that the prophecies were true, that Jesus was the, the Messiah, the Christ is going to come from the line of David. Verse 42, for David himself says in the book of Psalms, he's now quoting Psalm 110. David wrote 23 Psalms, maybe even a few more, but 23 are credited to him. And in Psalm 110, it is one of these messianic psalms. He's talking about the Messiah that is to come. He says, for David sa himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, the Lord said to my Lord. Just look at it here on the screen here. The Lord said to my Lord. So let me just paraphrase it for you a bit, okay? So David is now saying, the Lord, God, right? The Lord said to my, David's Lord, the Messiah, I could just even, you know, if, if some translation may even say, God said to David's Messiah. So the Lord said to my Lord. So God is saying about this to David's Messiah, sit over here. How could David's son be his Lord? How could it be true? This is the question that they're talking about. Israel's most famous king the second king of Israel, when they wanted a king, Saul was first, then David was, and David was anointed, and he is his, their most famous king. The city of David, Bethlehem, this is what we're talking about here. This place here, David is such a revered figure for the Jewish people. How could he call his son Lord? How does this make any sense? Then he says, sit at my right hand, the place of honor. Sorry, all you left-handed people. The place of honor, just with God, is the right hand. The right hand is the place of honor. The Messiah, the Christ, will be at the right hand of God. Verse 43, until I make your enemies your footstool. Enemies of God will ultimately be at their feet, at the right hand of God. But in time, enemies will be the footstool. Feet are associated with dirt. It's a place you don't want to be very long. Uh, and the justice of God is going to come, and one day people will be at their feet. You know, you think about a footstool. When you sit down in a, uh, a chair, you've got a place for your feet, and that's a, a place. Right? Just think about what that image is going to be like. It's the enemies are there, and God has, Jesus has his feet on the enemies. You're like, that sounds so crazy and rude and things, and we're talking about the judgment of God for people who say, I don't want you. And this is the holiness of God on display, and it's metaphorical, of course. But this idea of one day justice is going to happen, Jesus, his own life, is displaying the resurrection reality. Verse 44, David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? He goes for him there on their, their logic. The Messiah, the Christ, will be David's son. 
but he'll also be his Lord. This isn't the way the world works. The son is always lesser than the father. The son will always call the father Lord, not the other way around. You've seen those British shows where there's somebody who's serving there and they say, yes, my Lord, right? Yes, my Lord. It's like this respect for somebody who's older. The son always calls uh, the father Lord or the one who's revered. It's never that I would call my son my Lord, right? I don't ever call my son dad. That's not the relationship. So using logic to say that something is happening here, David in his psalm way back when he was writing it understood this reality that the Messiah would be from his line a son, but he also would be above me. And so he reveres him. The greatness of Jesus is so great that even Israel's greatest king will call him Lord. The Messiah is revealed here. Throughout our study in the Gospel of Luke, we've seen this theme of Jesus as Lord continue to develop. And in this section of Scripture that's related to the resurrection, we have a very clear articulation of the fact that Jesus Christ is actually called Lord. He has absolute authority. He is sovereign. He is king. He is God. And this should be attributed to him with our joy. He should be viewed as Lord God. He is not just a prophet. He's not just a good teacher. He is not just a servant or a friend. He's not just a healer. He is not just a preacher. Jesus is Lord of all. His very life shows us the reality of the resurrection. As he makes his way to the temple and then on to trial on the cross, we're going to see him fulfill the role to which he was called to from eternity past. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it says this, I will put enmity between, enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This was prophecy. This is what happened right after the fall. Genesis 3, 7 is the fall. Just eight verses later, we see the answer to the fall. We did wrong. We were separated from God. We went after our own way. We wanted to be God. We've sinned. And then the answer comes, Genesis 3.15. This is called the Proto-Evangelium. Proto-Evangelium means the first gospel. The first good news was right there in Genesis 3.15. Way before Jesus ever came to the earth, it was prophesied that there would be one, Satan, the serpent, who was going to bruise his heel, but Jesus would crush his head. As the picture shows right here, that's the gospel. The first gospel was preached back in Genesis 3.15, that Satan would be crushed. Your enemy would be crushed. All that you feel you're drawn to in the world, it could be taken away from you, and you can put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ Do you believe it? If you believe it, all you have to do is confess it. And if you've been coming for some time, we've been saying this over and over again. We have people texting us, I did confess. I confessed at this service. I confessed here. Thank you for... We've been hearing this over the uh, the time that we've been going through the word of God here in the Gospel of Luke. It's all over the Gospel of Luke. And here, once again, we're seeing it. Jesus is Lord. And it was prophesied. And he comes. His very life is showing it. If you want to confess Christ as Lord, just do it right where you are. Just say, I believe this. I confess. I don't want to be in eternity apart from God. You just confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And uh, there's a number coming up on the screen here. This number right here is our, our main church number. If you don't remember it, just always you can text that number and it's going to come to somebody here and just say, I want to confess. Just say, Jesus, say, I want to confess Christ. I want to be saved. I want to be transformed. I believe that God sent his son, Jesus and you will be saved, and we'll talk to you and help you with this decision that you're making. We've been looking at the resurrection reality. The skeptic denies it. Faith makes me worthy to attain it. The God of the living defends it. The life of Jesus displays it. And finally, the humble follower is influenced by it. The humble follower is influenced by it. We are changed. We are changed. Verse 45 goes on and says, and in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, beware of the scribes who like, now he's talking about the scribes, right? They're the ones who believe in the resurrection, the teachers of the law. Beware of them who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses for a pretense and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. 
so that now everybody could hear Jesus rebukes these scribes, and he describes them in this way. Beware of them. They have their long robes, and they're walking, and they're in the marketplace. They love to be greeted. They love to be seen. They are good at speaking, and they make these long prayers. Everybody's impressed and intimidated by them. They want the places of honor, the best seats. They devour the widow's homes. They're taking what's not theirs, and they are already condemned, so beware of them. He's making a point here to the disciples who are listening. Don't be like them. Be people of humility. Be people who understand. God knows exactly what they're like, and they're going to face their consequences. Verse 20, uh, chapter 21 now, verse 1. Jesus looked up. So he's teaching. He's doing all this thing, and he just looks up. And now here's a live illustration of what he's talking about. And saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. There's a comparison now between the rich and the poor. The poor widow has two coins, and she puts it in. The rich are putting their gifts into the offering box. And he said, truly, I tell you, the poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contribute out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. The widow is lifted up as the model of what we should be like, not like the rich person. It's not wrong to be rich. We've talked about this. We keep on bringing this up. You know, it's harder. It's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's not impossible, but it's harder because the trappings of the world can push us down. But here, again, this model of somebody who is rich being shown as doing things and everybody seeing it, and this poor widow who is not even seen probably by people, maybe more of a nuisance. She comes with her two copper coins and puts it in. In a world where we reject and push aside the marginalized, Jesus lifts her up because the humble will, we should be influenced by it. And the humble followers of Christ are influenced by the resurrection. Now, I know the resurrection hasn't happened here, but we see this idea throughout the scripture of what we're supposed to be like. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. If you're a follower of Christ, we should be people who display humility. Not false humility, not fake humility, but really seeking and asking God to help me look at myself rightly in comparison to you, God, and then in comparison to everybody else, we would get lower. Humble follower of Christ is influenced by it. The widow is a model of dependence on God. She had everything she gave and she put it there. Practically speaking, you know, I, like we don't do this. We don't tell you. It's like, all right, you know, all right, how much do you have left in your bank account? I got $1,000. Okay, put all of it right now in the offering box. Like we would never tell you to do that. Jesus isn't even telling the widow to do that. He's just commenting on what she felt like she needed to do. But he also makes a comment that the rich, so just take this, say, put in a $10,000 check in the offering, and that's a huge help. But the widow who only had two pennies put in all that she had and doesn't know where the food is going to come from next, that person made the bigger sacrifice. Does that make sense? It's upside down. It's not the way the world works. Typically, we're like, I'm going to get my name on a hospital because I've given a billion dollars. That's the way the world works. But Jesus says this widow is modeling for us what humility is all about. And we who follow Jesus, who've been changed by the resurrection reality in our life, we become these kinds of people who are sacrificial and humble and not thinking about ourselves greater than we are. The humble followers influenced by it. The resurrection of Christ is our response. The resurrection of Christ and our response to the resurrection is very important. It is the most important decision you will make. Earlier in our message, we learned about the kinsman redeemer, right? That's from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5. This kinsman redeemer, a family member who redeems the one who needs redemption. And Jesus is the Goel. He is the kinsman redeemer for us. Jesus is the closest relationship that we have when you think about God the Father and his family. His own son came to earth. This close relationship is the closest we have to God. And so the only person that could redeem us was Jesus, Joshua, Yeshua, Goel, the kinsman redeemer. And he did this for us. The resurrection reality. We're going to be talking about this in the days ahead when we get to Easter and that celebration. Have you made that decision? Do you believe it? You can confess Christ at any time, and I hope that some of you who are on the fence would get off the fence and come to saving faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity and this service, Lord. We've celebrated, and we're going to 
continue in that, Lord, right now. We thank you for the glorious celebration that we will be a part of one day when we are resurrected also, God. We thank you that you have made it so we don't just live our lives and die, but that we can live forever. And I pray, God, that you would help us, God, to to really be faithful. I pray for those that are on the fence, for those who are just wandering, who haven't made a decision. I pray you would take them off of the fence and they would trust you, Lord God, fully. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness and your love. And we're grateful, Lord, that you are with us, God, in every situation and circumstance. Father, we want this resurrection reality to be close to our own hearts, Lord, in our life. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing this song here. It's a celebration song uh, about a resurrection. And um, maybe some of you need to come out of that grave and confess Jesus as Lord. Come on. Let's lift up our voices now.